and great to see you all. We're currently doing a series called Jesus, A Journey Through the Gospel of Mark. Um, we're not doing like a verse by verse exposition, we're just picking up some of the key themes and key points from, from the chapters. And today we've reached chapter 14. And the sermon is called Will You Stand Firm? So we're going to be looking at how we stand firm during trials and difficult times. You know, it's really easy to say we trust God when things are good, but what about when times are difficult? What about when we're put to the test? Now, someone mentioned Pastor Mark's not here with us today, but there's, I don't think it's by chance that he's chosen me to do this because throughout time I have been through some particularly tough times, well-known tough times. Um, I've got some, some pictorial evidence of that. Do you remember that Thai cave disaster where the kids were stuck in a Thai cave? It's not well-known, but I was actually with them at the time. There's me. Um, it's tough, tough times. But I, you can see my flute there. I, I played some 80s tunes on my flute just to keep the pressure down. It was dank, it was dark, but a tough time and we got through it. Many of you will remember the tri- the old people anyway amongst us, the trial of the century, <laughs> OJ Simpson. I was there again at that, at that trial, not taking sides. You can see my flute again, just trying to keep the pressure down in a tough situation. You know, I know what it's like to be in trials and tough times and stand firm. Now those were big events. But the event we're going to look at today is, in human terms, even bigger. Uh, we're going to start reading shortly from verse 26 in chapter 14. But before that, let's just set the scene. You know, today's passage starts just after the Passover meal ends. So it would have been about midnight. Um, it would have been really dark outside, just moonlight lighting them up. Maybe there would have probably been some houses up as well because it's Passover. And they'd have just spent six hours together in the upper room having their Passover meal. And as they left that room, they must have had so many thoughts swirling about through their head. Jesus had just prophesied that he was going to be, and he said it before, we just prophesied again, he was going to be delivered up to be crucified. And during that Passover meal, he'd already said that one of them would betray him. And normally at Passover, things follow a very similar pattern. It was a tradition, sort of set in time, established in the Bible. But Jesus established the communion at that meal. So with the unleavened bread, normally what would happen is that whoever was leading the Passover meal would say, this bread is for our affliction. This is the bread of the affliction of our fathers in Egypt in the wilderness. But what Jesus did, he said, this is my body. This is the bread of my affliction. And with the wine, the cup would normally go around four times around the table to represent the four promises God had given the children of Israel. You know, I will bring you out. I will rid you of your bondage. I will pay your redemption price. I will take you away to be my people. But Jesus said, this is the cup of my blood. This is the cup of my redemption poured out for forgiveness. You know, Jesus declared that this was going to be his last meal. You know, there would be no need for a sacrificial lamb at the Passover meal they had because Jesus was that sacrificial lamb. And it is at that point that we pick up today's main verse. So we're going to read uh, Mark 14, verses 26 to 52. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, 
he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping with their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew a sword and struck the servant on the high pri- of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left with the linen cloth and ran away naked. So, as we've mentioned, today's passage is about will you stand firm? And we're going to start by looking at the fact that we will have trials and situations that we're not secure in that we'll need to stand firm in. You know, at a very high level, just looking at the disciples, it looks as though everything is falling apart. Before they reached the Mount of Olives, they could see that Jesus was in control. You know, he spoke with unrivaled authority. He stood up to those in power. He planned and directed and guided them over three years, casting out demons. He had authority over the weather. He brought people back to life. So much so that they proclaimed that he was God. They had seen all that he had done. But even though Jesus had prophesied that that this would happen, that his life would be taken, in the disciples' eyes, everything was crumbling around them. You know, Jesus was arrested, he was put on trial and put to death. From the outside, looking into the disciples, it seemed as though Jesus had lost control, and that put them in, in mortal danger, in danger for their lives. You know, they've had challenges over the three years to this point, but the very foundation of their belief that got them to where they are now was shaking. What makes this passage that we just read really powerful is that... Um, we can compare and contrast how the disciples acted and how Jesus reacted as well to trials and challenges. Throughout his life, of course, Jesus has faced massive trials and challenges as well, such as like the 40-day time of fasting where he was tempted by Satan. But perhaps now is the biggest trial for him because whilst he knew his, tri- his path was going to take him to death, it was now that the time had come to fulfill that promise. And we can see from this passage, it doesn't say Jesus was just a bit worried or anxious. You know, he was deeply distressed and troubled. His soul wasn't just overwhelmed, but it says he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You know, he was so distressed that he fell. He fell to the ground and just implored his father, Father, if it is possible, if it is all possible, please take this cup from me. Let this hour pass. Now, if it's possible, don't make me drink this cup. You know, Jesus, wasn't, was, Jesus was in just extreme mental anguish, and in that anguish, he prayed. We read in Luke that, that his sweat became like great drops of blood. And just like Jesus, those blood drops fell to the ground. He prayed. For an hour, he prayed in agony. Abba, Father, take this cup from me. You know, we don't know what, Jesus, what the Father said back to Jesus, but we do know that, that the cup was not taken. The Father said no. And Jesus prayed again to the Father, take this cup from me. No was the answer. You know, everything Jesus went through at Gethsemane, in his darkest moment, he went through alone. Everything he went through on his cross, he went through alone because the disciples were asleep. They were not by his side. They were not watching. And so it is with us that we will also face trials. Throughout the New Testament, in various places, we're told to Expect suffering, trouble, trials. Somebody that has been a rock in our life will no longer be so, maybe through illness or or death. Loved ones will will let us down. Perhaps through sin or moral failure, others will let us down or we let ourselves down. You know, at work, at church, in our families, 
we will have difficult and stressful situations. You know, we'll be given unreasonable demands against us and we'll be, we'll be pushed to breaking point sometimes by other people in our lives. I'm sure we can all think of, like, we've all gone through difficult times and situations in our lives, some of which may seem entirely unimportant, and yet actually it's our reaction to those times that can hint at something important in our hearts. And for myself, I can think of, of challenges I've had from like, having cancer and getting over it to, to really stressful work situations with managers of debatable kind of moral standards, from just the day-to-day -day life of having a family, a wife, kids, a mother-in-law. And I've handled them all better or worse to differing degrees. And one of the things that's been really challenging for me as I've been preparing for this is not so much, you know, how have I handled those big events, but, but how do I handle the day-to-day -day trials? How do I handle the mundane sort of things that happen day by day that get in the way and don't work out how I hope? You know, as we read through the scriptures in the Bible, it is, it's just abundantly clear that we will face trials. And the question the Bible asks isn't like, okay, how can we avoid those trials? The question is, how can we handle those trials of our lives? How do we react when things don't go as we hoped or planned? Okay, so the rest of the talk we're going to split into two sections. The first section will be looking at the trials and the, that, that, Peter, that Peter had, and then we'll see what happened after those trials. So the main part, you know, how do we handle our trials? And we're going to look at three different ways that Peter sort of handled or, or didn't handle um, the trials and the challenge that he faced. And the first one is about pride versus humility. Okay, now I've got a few charts. I'm an accountant. I love charts. So I've got a few charts here with some stats. So the first is that um, some people were asked, and they said, would you like, this is like in a workplace setting, would you like your leader to be humble? 95% of people said, yeah, we want a humble leader. Um, the next question was to ask the leaders, do you see yourself as a humble leader? 80% of the leaders said, yeah, I'm a humble leader. That's good. Um, then the second question, or third question was, do you, like the people, those employees, do you see your leader as humble? Only 36% said, yeah, that's, that's a humble leader. Um, even worse, potentially, there's another study done, and it looked at um, like people that display humility. Only 15% of people apparently Ex ex exhibit extreme humility in their life, really this sort of high-level stuff. So once again, I like to think Mark's picked me for this, this passage for a reason. Um, I asked every person that has ever worked for me, do you see David as a humble leader? And the next chart shows 100%. 100% of people said, yes, David is a humble leader. Unfortunately, tight, like, I was preparing this preach. I was very busy. I didn't actually have time to ask people, but I just, like, I, I kind of just worked out in my head what people would have responded, and <laughs> I pride myself on being a good judge of people's minds, so I'm confident this is a very accurate, um, accurate representation. Going back to the passage, Jesus and the disciples, they just crossed Kidron Valley to reach the Mount of Olives. Um, that's the same place that King David had gone a thousand years earlier when he was rejected as king and betrayed by a friend. So the parallels... Um, continue there. For the disciples, immediately they're put on the back foot when Jesus said that they're going to fall away and reject him. But the response was similar as when Jesus first said that he was going to have to give his life away. At that point, Jesus said, no, no, Jesus, you're wrong. That's not going to happen. You're not going to give your life away. And again here, Peter contradicts Jesus because that's not how Peter saw things working out. That's not what Peter wanted to happen. Peter's pride would not let him agree with what Jesus had said. He said, not me, you know, I will never fall away. I will stand firm. You know, I can, I, looking around the room, I can see where you might think some other people might, might fall. They're not quite as strong as me, but I'm Peter. You know, I will never deny you, Jesus. I will never dis deny you. But Jesus said, you know what, actually, three times you were going to deny me, Peter. Not just once, but three times. But Peter was emphatic, you know, I will die with you. I will go through to death with you, Jesus. And why wouldn't he be confident? Look at his track record. You know, he, he had, did preach with power. He also healed people, and he also cast out demons. He was Peter. He was the one that loved Jesus more than everyone else. Peter's pride meant that he had more confidence in his own strength than the word of Jesus. You know, before this, Peter had called Jesus Christ, the Son of living God, and yet he felt that he knew better than Jesus. <coughs> Not only that, but here is Jesus proclaiming a prophecy and quoting scripture. So Peter's saying, you know what? 
I know better. I know better than you, Jesus, and I know better than the Bible. I know better than the prophecies. You know, pride can keep, creep up on us in all parts of our life, and it can just be so insidious. I've got this really small, I say silly, like really small example earlier from myself at work. I just made this mistake. I misinterpreted like an instruction that my manager gave me, and I then fed that on to one of the deans, who's like one of the big people at our college, um, the top people. And it wasn't a disaster. No time was wasted, no money was lost, but I knew as soon as I had to go back and correct him, he was going to be like really annoyed, um, and he was also renowned as being kind of the most scary of the deans. But I knew he was going to be annoyed. More than that, though, basically, it was going to make me look a bit stupid, because I'd made a mistake. I'd made a stupid mistake. I was being a bit careless, and I hadn't, hadn't really thought it through. And, and I was thinking, like, I was up at night thinking, like, how can I resolve this without like, having to say I made a mistake? How, what are the things, like, how could I phrase it in a way that will get me around it? And as I was thinking it and praying it, it just became clear to me that it was just my pride. I was just allowing my pride to cloud my judgment of what the most obvious and easy thing was to do, which was just to, to be honest and sort the situation out. And what struck me so much was that it was such a, an insignificant thing so unimportant in the grand scheme of my life. I will not remember it in 30 years' time, but it was enough to trigger my pride that I didn't want to put myself in that situation. And if pride can creep up on me in such a tiny thing, without me noticing it necessarily at first, what about bigger things in my life? How dangerous can pride be then? And yet compare that to Jesus, who did not come with pride, he came with humility. He was faced with the prospect of having to lay his life down and be crucified, and he didn't want that pain. He didn't want to be separated from the Father during that period of time, but Jesus was obedient in his prayers. No matter what was thrown at Jesus, or how he was feeling, or how he was being tempted, it was always trumped by following the Father's will. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he was always perfectly following the Father. At Gethsemane, we see him stagger, but when he staggers, he doesn't sin. When he stags, he throws himself for the Father and says, not my will, but yours. When his humanity, his human is balked at what he was facing, at the suffering he was about to have, so much that he sweated blood, he submitted himself to the Father and in prayer said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Even in such grief and distress as seeing what was going to happen to him on the cross, he was obedient to the Father, and he put us, his love for us above his own life. And so how do we respond to this? In Proverbs, there's a couple of really useful Proverbs. Um, One's pride will bring him low, but he is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. And when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Of course, I don't think it's any surprise to say that we should follow Jesus' example and be humble and not proud. Perhaps above all else, when we have pride, it gets in the way of us hearing God's word. Whether that is hearing God's word through scriptures, whether it is hearing words directly um, revealed to us, to, from God to us, or whether it's from brothers and sisters reaching out in, in challenging us in areas of our lives scripturally. Um, you know, the main way for us to keep pride at bay is to keep close to God, to focus more on God than ourselves. But that is such a challenging thing to do. And so I just ask us all just to honestly look at ourselves and think, where do, where do I have pride in my life? Where, does, where do my shackles kind of get raised? You know, how do I feel when someone questions me or challenges me about something I've done or something I think? You know, how do you feel when you have a sermon that kind of butts up against what you, what you think or, or the way that you live your life? You know, do you enjoy getting advice from other people? How do you feel when you own up to a mistake you've made um, or when you've let someone down? You know, when you shine a light on your life and you see things you don't like about yourself, do you kind of take the light away and just ignore it? Or do you try and, and face it and go through the difficulties of, of improving that situation? You know, if we are to stand firm in our trials... We must approach them with humility and not pride. Peter's pride was to believe that he could do it all, that he was strong, but actually his strength was just an illusion. And that moves us on to our second point, which is weakness versus strength. You know, the first sign of weakness we see in today's passage comes in the Garden of Gethsemane, with Jesus humbly prostrate on the floor, praying to his father, 
sweating blood as he poured out his heart, he made just one request. He said, remain here and watch. But Peter, James, John, they, they fell asleep. Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus went away and prayed some more. And when he came back, they were asleep again. They didn't even know what to say to Jesus this time. They were so embarrassed and shamed. But he went away again, and he came back, and they were asleep again. Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. You know, three times they had the chance to keep watching to pray. Three times they fell asleep. Three times their flesh was so weak they could not even pray, seeing Jesus in such distress at that time. They were, they were willing. They did not not want to, but they were weak. And so, you know, whilst the prayers were, were, these dark clouds were brewing, there was no prayer, or at least a prayer that was very poor. You know, pray that you will not enter temptation, Jesus implored them. But by the time the soldiers arrived, the moment has passed, and it was too late to pray that they would um, not be tempted. It was too late to pray that they would be strengthened. And the main point I want to make here that is relevant to us when we're thinking about pride and humility, or also weakness and strength, is that these things are formed before the trial and the difficult times even start. You know, we've got halfway through the sermon, and we haven't even reached the point yet where Peter is actually properly tested and asked to stand firm. We're going to come to that next. And that isn't because this is like a, a massive three-hour-long sermon. It's because, actually, our ability to stand firm in times of adversity is massively influenced by how prepared we are before we even get to that tough time. Proverbs 24 says, if you are weak in a crisis, you are weak indeed. You know, it doesn't say if you're weak in a crisis, ah, you know, it was a really tough time, there were circumstantial things going on, you were worried, tired, stressed, you know, don't worry about it, you did the best you could. No, you know, if you're weak in a crisis, you're weak, you're weak indeed. Because if we're weak in a crisis, if we're weak and we're pushed and probed and uncomfortable, that's, that's just such a the sign that, that we are not strong, but that we are weak. Remember Jesus said to Peter, when he could not stay awake. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, many of us may be watching the Olympics at the moment. Those athletes, they don't just like turn up and try and do their best. They train for years and years and years beforehand to build up their skills and strengths. We just see the culmination of someone who then like runs 100 meters really quickly in, in 10 seconds, much faster than we could. But actually the effort was in the training, the weeks and weeks before that, the years and years. Training when they don't want to and when they're unmotivated. Training when it's difficult to see the improvement week or week. Difficult when they've just faced that setback. And some of you may counter me there and say, David, I look at you and I see a buff man. I see someone that, that could probably just walk up to the Olympics and uh, claim a gold. I reckon you could do that. Well, firstly, thank you for those of you that do think that. It's very, I gratefully accept it. Um, it's very touching. But you just flick on the TV and see those people that have finely tuned their body. They finely tuned all their mechanics so that, oh, they can just smash every single event. You know, it doesn't matter if I can stay calm under pressure. It doesn't matter if I really, really, really want it a lot. I cannot compete because they have prepared and they have trained. They're ready and I am weak. And so it is as Christians. We may see how, how, see how someone responds in a really difficult situation and think, wow, didn't they, they did well there, didn't they? That's very impressive. I wish I could uh, do that, but I never could. But so much of how those people would have responded would have hinged on, on how they had prepared beforehand. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 25 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get the crown that will that will not. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. You know, we should be in strict training to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, a life where we live in humility and spiritual strength, a life where we are strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Training now, you know, day after day, rain or shine tired or full of energy, happy or sad, because when we build our spiritual muscles, then it becomes second nature to us. 
You know, we don't have the advantage of an athlete of knowing the exact time and the exact date of when they're going to have the event. We don't have the foresight that Jesus had to know that he is about to, to be crucified on the cross. But we do know, this is, this is not a great thing, we do know that we're going to face trials and we're going to face them in our lives regularly. We know we're going to be tempted day by day, so we need to be ready for them. But what is our training? Well, not surprisingly, Jesus perfectly models this for us. Throughout his life, Jesus was continually finding solitude and time alone with the Father. And he would retreat from the crowds and find a quiet place to rest and pray. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see him do what he's done so many times before. He, he, he retreated and he prayed to his Father. You know, three times he placed himself in the will of the Father. Three times he prayed for strength to fulfill that will and to be ready. So that he was ready to be mocked and, and whipped, ready to be crucified on the cross for us. And so if we want to be strong, then it comes from allowing God spirit to strengthen us it comes from surrendering ourselves to god's authority not putting ourselves above him and it comes from spending time with god in prayer from spending time reading and grappling with his word through the bible not just like when we're in the mire or we're desperate but day to day to build our spiritual muscles you know to build our relationship with god so that we learn to trust him in all of our circumstances and just like for those athletes, for them, that's pretty much their priority in life. You know, they will say, for the next four years, that's my training regime. I'm going to do that to make sure I'm ready. For us, it needs to be our priority. They can get their gold model, which actually I found out yesterday, as Lily mentioned to my wife, that it's only gold around the edges. Most of it's not gold, so that's a bit of a con. They get that trashy little thing. We get an amazing relationship with God and eternal life. I mean, that's a much better... Pro- I, would, I mean, I wouldn't mind a gold medal, but I'd much rather have <laughs> the, uh, God's salvation. You know, just a few things the psalm says about the Lord is that he is our refuge and strong tower. The Lord is our rock and our mighty fortress, that he is our shield, our stronghold and deliverer. The Lord is our light and salvation. He is our strength, the strength of our life. You know, the Lord is the strength. And so the challenge that is thrown at our feet is, are we training? And if we are, how well are we training? Like, are we really reading and grappling with the word of God? And are we putting it into practice? Are we holding ourselves accountable to other brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we praying daily and drawing close to the Lord? Are we serving and others others, even serving and loving others rather than looking out for ourselves? Or are we just kind of hoping things will kind of be all right when things pan out, when a crisis comes? Our strength as Christians comes from the Lord, and our training is to be with him and serve him and learn from him. Okay, so let's move on to our, the third part of this first section, which is where actually we start to see um, the event happen. So we're going to move on to fear and courage. And as people, we have fear of many things. Some of the top fears apparently are heights, spiders, snakes, and clowns. Um, I think a reason Mark chose me is because I'm a very courageous man. I have a picture here from me recently. You can see me there. It's on a, on a hike, on a very high ledge, as you can see. There's a clown who was my hiking partner. Um, two snakes as hiking poles, and there is actually, you can't quite see it, but a spider on my head. Um, I looked fear in the face, and fear trembled, and it couldn't handle me, basically. What I would say is snakes make really bad walking poles. They kind of, like, but other than that, you know, that was, yeah, it's a tough walk, but it was, it was good. And so I think that is probably the reason why I was picked for this as well. But no matter how prepared we are, there is going to become a time of reckoning. <coughs> There's a time when we're going to be called to have those trials and stand firm. If we go back and look into our Bibles, let's see how the story develops after the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, so Jesus has been arrested. Um, he was brought back before the council to the high priest. And they were seeking here, we're told they're seeking testimony so that they can put Jesus to death. Um, we're going to go back into our yeah, Mark chapter 14, you can see there. And so the, the disciples had all now pretty much fallen away. And I guess to Peter's credit, he was still here at this point, so that's, that's good for him. Um, and we pick it up at Mark chapter 14, verse 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, 
This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you're a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Unfortunately, you know, fear overcame Peter almost immediately that he was put under pressure. You know, there wasn't exactly some like, hard inquisition here. There was just a, a couple of people, um, this is a girl there, just asking him, like, are, you, are you related, are you part of this Jesus group? But he could only assume that that close connection for him would actually mean that he would be put on trial next. And so, despite like, really clearly saying to Jesus, I'm going to stand with you to the death, he stumbled over his denial immediately. You know, he approached a second time, and he stumbled again, and he wouldn't quite say it. And the third time, the third time, he cursed himself, he swore. He couldn't even bring himself to say Jesus' name. You know, this man, he said. I don't know this man. And then the rooster crowed, and he realized what he'd done, and he broke down and wept. You know, it turned out that actually Peter wasn't ready to give his life for Jesus. It was too dangerous. He still loved Jesus. He loved Jesus <laughs> so much. But the fear, the fear was too much, and the fear won. Now, he was ashamed of Jesus. He was ashamed to be associated with Jesus. How could this happen? This, was, this is Peter. You know, Peter said, to whom shall we go? You and you alone have the words of eternal life to Jesus. You, know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. No, this is Peter. This is the greatest leader we've got at this point in the early church. And this isn't just like a momentary slip up from Peter. Three times he denies Jesus. And I rattled through that relatively quickly, but actually those three denials have been spread over two hours. The same two hours between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. when Jesus was on trial. He had time to like think things over and realize, no, I should not have denied Jesus. But his fear was so much that he could not. You know, on the main stage, we see Jesus in this glorious triumph, just speaking honestly, knowing it was going to lead him to the cross and to cost him his life. And then in the shadows, we see Peter lying, lying, trying desperately to preserve his life. And you know, Jesus st stood with courage. He faced the hatred. He, hatred. he bore immense pain, indignity, betrayal, abandonment to death on the cross, you know, to bear sin willingly for the sake of, of, of people that forsook him at his final hour. Men who, who fell asleep at the Garden of Gethsemane, and then they scattered by the time he got to the cross. You know, it's, it's really easy to see how Peter may be fearful. You know, suddenly Jesus' prophecies that he would die are, are so much more real. He can see it happening in front of him. But this isn't just a one-off event in church history. It's something that that is a challenge for all of us as Christians, you know, today and in the past. You know, perhaps Paul is, is one of the best examples of someone rising above this. In Romans 1.16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. You know, he says to Timothy, I'm not ashamed to suffer for Christ. You know, the fact that Paul was writing to Timothy suggests that maybe, that definitely, Timothy was struggling with, with being ashamed of the gospel. You know, elsewhere, we read, Paul wrote to him and said, do not be ashamed of the Lord. And Peter, the Peter that we've been talking about mostly today, said to Peter, don't be ashamed, sorry, said to um, Timothy, don't be ashamed of Christ. So Timothy clearly had some, some slight problem just, just getting across that shame. You know, we're not impervious to the very same momentary shame that comes on us out of fear. It doesn't mean we're denying Christ. You know, Peter did not, um, sorry, Peter did not love Christ any less rather than that moment, but it doesn't, didn't stop him from loving him. You know, we can deny him through our lips, like Peter very outright saying, I do not know who this man is, or we can deny him through our lips just by being quiet in silence. We can deny him through our actions when we do not show love to others. You know, and we don't need to be in a courtroom to be on trial, because our trial actually is everyday life. Every day we live is a trial of our integrity, a trial of our ability to be a faithful witness to Jesus, a trial to show love in times of hardship. 
The fear of, of what other people think or how they may react is a real fear. You know, we can be mature Christians. You could have had the best life in the world as a, a Christian and still allow the fear of man to cloud your, cloud your judgments. You know, if Peter can deny Jesus through fear, then that can befall any of us. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. You know, have you got any snares lying around you? Have you got any traps that, that make you feel fraught with danger? You know, fear is a raw emotion. And we all know exactly how, how fear can take hold. You know, where in our life is it that you most struggle with fear? Where do you, you really need that godly courage? Do you hold your tongue and, and hide your Christianity in certain circumstances or through shame or fear of what others may say or think? Do you, do you hold back from serving sometimes because you fear that maybe you won't do it as well as you would like to do it or, or you won't be good enough in your eyes? Or in groups, do you kind of do, you do things or say things out of fear of, of looking different to others? You know, we should take our fears, just as Jesus did, and pray for strength and courage through the Lord. I was thinking about this, one of the other fears, apparently, I mentioned the four things that a lot of people like, are scared of, like snakes, one of the other ones is public speaking. And for me, this should be the most scary thing in the world. I am naturally exceptionally introverted. Like, if you look through my old school report, so like, I mean, Dave's quite good, but can he just speak? Like, can he ever speak? Um, when lockdown happened, I think, I know lockdown's not a good thing. I'm not wishing it again. When lockdown happened, I was like, this is fantastic. Legally, I can like stay in my house, not speak to other people. This is awesome. I love this. Um, that's my natural thing. And, and so when my pastor at my last church said, David, can you preach? I thought I would instantly, like, I hate speaking. Even now, if I'm having to say something at work, I don't really like to do it. But, but God has, through his spirit, given me a courage, like, just to speak, to speak the word of God. And I'm not saying like that in a, in a prideful way. I'm not saying my words are always perfect, but at the same time, like, naturally, I, this is, like, should be the worst thing in the world for me, and yet I do not fear that fear. Not because of anything, like, I didn't go any training, didn't do anything, but God just, through his spirit, gave me the ability to, to do it. And that, that's a real encouragement for me in many areas of my life when I, I doubt what God can do. It's like, David, you can, you can do that when you couldn't even say one word in a class of eight people. Like, you can, you can talk now in public. You know, we should take our fears... Don't ignore them, but just as Jesus did, come and pray for strength and courage. For in the Lord, we have safety. You know, in Jesus, we have safety from our fears. Now, do we really trust that when bad things happen, God is sovereign? Or are we so caught up in the day-to-day -day things in life that we miss that bigger picture? You know, no matter what circumstances are swirling around us, we have safety and we have peace in the Lord. Okay, so we've seen some of the ways we can stand firm or not. And in the final section, we're going to see what happened to Peter next and what it means for us. And we're going to look at how we're forgiven and restored. One obvious thing to point out at the outset is, like we sort of touched on, Peter did not stand firm. You know, when the, when the rooster crowed for that third time, Jesus tells us, like, he looked at the Peter in the eye, and suddenly Peter's conscience was aroused, and he, he fell to the floor. He'd failed Jesus, not only by his own high standards, but to the point of denying who Jesus even was. Like how rotten he must have felt when he looked upon Jesus in all his perfection. You know, if only there was something that he could have as a, a redeeming excuse, like, but there was no flaw, there was no blemish in anything Jesus had done. There was not one thing Peter could cling to to excuse his failure. And to deny Jesus when he needed a friend the most, when everyone had denied him and forsaken him. But three times, three times Peter denied him. You know, the important thing for us is that, just as I said a bit earlier ago, if Peter can fall short so completely, then we can also fall short. Maybe not in such a spectacular open way as Peter, but if we study our lives, I'm sure we can see times when we have fallen short, when we've not stood up to the high standards that Jesus set, so we've not treated others as we wish we, we could have done. Perhaps Perhaps some of us have, have backslidden a bit, you know, whereas once we held Jesus so clearly, now he's a bit more distant. Once we had such zeal and such excitement on a day-to-day -day basis to have that time to spend with God, but now it's all quite comfortable. You know, maybe you keep quiet when that opportunity comes to, to mention your faith. You know, is that not denying Jesus? And that persistent sin that, that tempts you again and again... <laughs> You just don't seem able to stand firm against it, or at least 
only very rarely. Now consider, consider where you fall short and consider when you don't stand firm and when you sin. Now does, it, does it pain you when you think of that? Does it make you feel shame or convicted? I mean, if, that's not necessarily a bad thing if it does because that is exactly the way Peter felt that day. And we will see next what happened to Peter after that. Because the story of Peter does not end with desolation. It doesn't end with him on that floor crying. So we're going to pick up the story. We're going to flip into the Gospel of John now. um, Chapter 21, verses 15 to 19. And this is after Jesus has been resurrected and the disciples are around him. They're on like a little beach, I think. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and the other will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. You know, the Peter story is a perfect example of the gospel and of salvation in action. That if, or rather when, we do not stand firm, there is always a way open for, firstly, repentance, secondly, forgiveness, and thirdly, restoration. You know, whilst Peter, whilst Peter felt remorse and devastation for how he felt, he didn't, his faith didn't fail him completely. You know, just as Jesus said it would not. He turned up at the tomb and he was there again. There we see him at the beach. No doubt he remembered Jesus' words that he would not forsake him. And he clung to those words. And they came true. And Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? You know, Jesus gained Peter the opportunity to proclaim his love and repent. One time for each time he denied Jesus. Three times for three times. And the shame was wiped away with the simple simple response of, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, there's no grandstanding and no pride that he was the best of the best. Just, Lord, you know that I love you. Every single time, Jesus leads him to repentance and he repents. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so it is that that first step is for us to confess our sins. And that should be no breaking news for many of us. You know, there's a reason the Lord's Prayer includes that and praying for our trespasses or our sins to be forgiven, because we need to confess our sins again and again. So if now you are feeling guilt or shame, then, you know, confess your sins, bring them to the foot of the cross. Bring them before Jesus. Don't hang on to them through pride or shame or try and improve things um, before you repent because all that will do is drag you down. You know, Jesus, Jesus knows where we have not stood firm and where we have fallen shirt, short. And all he asks is, do you love me? You know, do you love me enough to put aside your trust, your, um, your pride, and to trust in me? Do you love me? And you may think, oh, what I've done is probably even worse than Peter, or I've done so many things. The trouble with thinking that way is that that puts such far too low an opinion on what Jesus achieved on the cross. You know, Jesus was committed to Peter, and he is committed to those of us that have put faith in him. You know, he died for us whilst knowing that we would not stand firm. And after repentance comes secondly forgiveness. You know, the scandal of grace is that no matter what we've done, no matter what shame we are holding on to because of Jesus' sacrifice, it will be forgiven if we repent. Remember at the Last Supper, as the wine was passed around, Jesus said, this is the cup of my blood. This is the cup of my redemption poured out for forgiveness. Jesus' blood has now been given for us on the cross for our forgiveness. 
Whilst Peter was denying Jesus whilst he was on trial, Jesus was already standing in the place of Peter and starting to take on that punishment that, that Peter deserved. And going back to 1 John 1, 9, notice how it says he is faithful and just to forgive. You know, when we're forgiven, it doesn't say he is faithful and merciful to forgive. It says he is just to forgive. We are forgiven because God is just. It is justice that we are forgiven. It would be injustice if, if Jesus paid the price and then we had to pay the price again. That is why we can come with such confidence because it is an infallible case that we are forgiven because the case is won. Jesus has laid down his life for every sin that we have done. But on top of this forgiveness, we are also restored. You know, three times after Peter proclaimed his love for Jesus, Jesus also called him to serve. He said, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And the passage follows and closes rather with Jesus saying, follow me. When we're forgiven, we're not just forgiven from our sins for our own good. We are forgiven so that we can be part of building the kingdom of God.